Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cassandra McGee. I'm a senior program manager with JFF, and welcome to today's Youth Apprenticeship Works Virtual Office Hour. Today, we are discussing apprenticeable youth occupations, and our discussion will be led by Jerry Ghazi, president of Institute for American for the Institute for American App Apprenticeships. Um, this project is led through the U.S. Department of Labor's um, Youth Apprenticeship Intermediaries Project, and we welcome you to the conversation. As a reminder, this session will be recorded, so if you're not the primary speaker, we do request that you mute your phone lines uh, for best call quality. However, we do want you to participate, so you can stick questions or comments and to, uh, based upon today's topic in the chat box or live during question and answer time. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andrea messing Matthew, who is a director with JFF. So Andrea. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we look forward to the conversation. As Cassandra mentioned earlier, we do want to make this really conversational. So please do come with your questions. You can either put them in the chat box or you can um, simply come off of mute. Um, we definitely want to make this a uh, conversational space for everybody. Um, Jerry, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, we truly do want this to be interactive. So what I did is I posed a bunch of questions in two slides. I can give a lot of information, but more importantly, it's really to understand where each of you are at with youth apprenticeships, right? And truly what they mean. I have been in this working in this space for over 20 years in the registered youth apprenticeship space and for probably about 35 years in the unregistered space. And I say that to begin with by saying really what defines an apprenticeship, right? So an apprenticeship basically is an employee development strategy or process. It's a process in which an employer makes a, uh, a, a, an effort and a, a concise effort to develop its employee from a one point to another point. And that first point is from maybe a beginning or an upskilling uh, with uh, youth apprenticeships. It's usually for a, a person entering their, their career for the first time and bringing them to full competency. So it's taking from a non-competent position to a fully competent position. And the most important thing is in a given occupation, right? And that doesn't mean that once the person completes that occupation, especially with youth, that they remain in that occupation. They may move on to other apprenticeships or other opportunities within that employee, right? So the most important thing that defines an apprenticeship is it is an employee development process where an employer is investing in an individual prior to them having experiences and prior to them having education and knowledge and providing that as part of their job, right? With that definition, we move on to the next question, which is what defines a youth apprenticeship? And again, if you have questions, please interrupt me or throw them in the chat. And Cassandra, I would, really, I, I would really appreciate if you could monitor that and just cut me off at any point in time. So what defines a youth apprenticeship? It's an apprenticeship for individuals who are 16 or 17 years of age. That's the only difference. And I wanna stress that. Really a youth apprenticeship of those individuals who are 16 and 17 that require a parent to actually bind them to the apprenticeship agreement. So a parent's signature is required. Everything else can be identical to a regular apprenticeship, to an adult apprenticeship, right? Now, an apprenticeship you have in any given apprenticeship, you always have a starting point and an ending point, right? And that starting point is where you bring on an individual and you basically may have certain prerequisites for their beginning of an apprenticeship. You may require them to have a certain degree. You may require them to have a certain certification. You may require them to be a certain age before they can participate in an employer's apprenticeship. And then during the apprenticeship, there may be certain requirements, like a continuation of a valid driver's license, et cetera, to continue in that apprenticeship. And then there's an exit point. So how does that employer define their apprenticeship for the exit point. When did they determine that a person is fully competent? And there may be some other elements along with just showing that you're fully competent in the occupation. You may require the attainment of a degree. You may require the attainment of a certification as part of completing the apprenticeship. So you have what we call the prerequisites, right? You have the actual responsibilities during the apprenticeship, and then you have the exit of that apprenticeship. And that's all taking an individual through an employee development process. 
And the key I'm going to keep going back to is a process of developing an employee from point A to point B where they're not competent in a given occupation and you're bringing them to full competency. And it could be they can join anywhere in that pathway, right? So when you think about a youth, you got to think about where are they in the spectrum of potential candidates for an apprenticeship, right? 16 and 17 year olds are usually in high school, right? And so you, when you start thinking about are they, you know, which type of youth apprenticeships are appropriate for which types of occupations, right? And so are youth, appre appro uh, are youth apprenticeships appropriate for all kinds of occupations? And I challenge you to think about this. I believe they are. I believe that any occupation can be defined in a way in which a youth, 16 or 17, could participate in that apprenticeship, right? Even to the point of having engineers, right? So let's say there's an, we actually created an aerospace engineer. It's a four-year requirement to complete the apprenticeship, right? A four-year degree requirement, I'm sorry, to complete it. But an individual in high school could begin by taking some dual enrollment classes and they can start participating in basically gaining college credit towards that degree as they are employed by that employer and moving through a process. So it's really important to see that, you know, you know, it's truly, if you want to push the envelope, and we have that youth apprenticeships, what types of youth apprenticeships could be appropriate for all different types of occupations. And the only limiting factor is whether the employer will accept developing that person, that youth as their employee from an early age through to full competency in that given occupation. The one thing I do want to stress before I move on is that career exploration is not an apprenticeship, right? So one of the key things that an employer is going to look for is a commitment by a youth to come to full competency in that given occupation that they're being sponsored in. So when you have an employer who's willing to bring on an individual youth, right, and pay them as they're providing them education and as they're providing them work experiences, they want to ensure that that person isn't just exploring that as a potential career, but wants to make that first step the first step in their career. That doesn't mean it has to end there, right? A lot of folks say, well, 16 and 17 year olds, they don't know what they really want to do at that age. They're exploring all the possibilities. And I, I challenge you to think about youth are, when given direction and given mentoring, can explore a specific path, a specific occupation at that age, and then they could change later, but they become a valuable asset an employee of that employer, and that employer then will open up other opportunities to that individual, right? But when we start thinking about what are the most appropriate apprenticeable occupations that can be leveraged when developing youth apprenticeships, what I would strongly suggest is that you look at what's considered an unregistered apprenticeship, you know, and look at the school system, the, 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 the secondary school system, particularly juniors and seniors and their participation in what we otherwise would call CTE, career and technical education. Because many of the career and technical education programs are career specific, they're occupation specific. Individual youth go into those programs wanting to be a programmer or wanting to be maybe an engineer or maybe to be a CNC machinist or work in advanced manufacturing or work in the culinary arts, right? They may want to actually uh, enter something in the business area. So they'll take a CTE program that focuses on a given occupation or set of occupations. And so when looking for opportunities to help your employers understand the benefit of investing in youth apprenticeships. You wanna look at what your current ecosystem of CTE offerings are so that you could suggest that ready available pool of candidates that you could potentially provide that employer as participants of their youth apprenticeship. I'm gonna pause there for a second before I move on to the second slide and see, are there any questions about what I've said? Kind of what I communicated. Key pieces being an apprenticeship is an employee development process. That process is identical for youth as well as it is for adults. The only difference is that a parent needs to sign off on the apprenticeship agreement when it's registered. 
that is taking a person from point A to point B, non-competency or not full competency to full competency in a given occupation, right? And it's an investment by an employer in that employee, in that youth, to bring them through both an educational experience related instruction and work experiences to be basically take them to full competency. And there are all tight, you know, there, I, I challenge anyone to say this occupation wouldn't be right for a youth. And I would challenge you in thinking about creative ways to make it right and how you would sell an employer. Because we have started apprenticeships, everything from payroll uh, in, at the, for youth for uh, um, uh, within the county, the payroll systems and payroll specialists to engineers. Um, we, we basically start them as software technicians or we start them as engineering technicians um, as they uh, are in high school. So there are many, many different types of other high functioning that you convince employers to say, let's see if we can move the bar and create an apprenticeship. Youth apprenticeships have been used in the trades for a long, long time. And there is a youth apprenticeship. There's an apprenticeship category, an occupation called the laborer. And many times youth apprenticeships start in that laborer occupation. And once they graduate high school and get a sense for all the different fields, electric, you know, uh, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, uh, carpentry, they may then choose a discipline to actually focus on as they continue, complete that laborer apprenticeship and move on to a higher level apprenticeship in one of those kind of trades occupations. So, Jerry, um, I have a question for you. And sure. then, Adele, I see um, your hand is raised. And so, once um, Jerry answers this question, please feel free to come off a, a mute, Adele, and answer, ask your question. So, can you give an example, perhaps, of an apprenticeship program in a non traditional um, field? And I put that in quotation mark non traditional, meaning that it may be an occupation that people might not have considered for youth apprenticeship. And how did you go about talking with um, employers in order to get that program developed? I'll give two examples. The first is a payroll specialist. Um, there was one large company that was hiring payroll specialists out of college. And they decided that they weren't getting the quality they needed and they wanted to invest at a lower level payroll specialist. So they approached their CTE programs and identified a CTE program that could provide them individuals who are participating in that CET program as employees. So a payroll specialist apprenticeship was created and it was one of the first in the country being created. Um, and we did that for that employer. So individuals were being recruited, not as graduates of the CTE, but as participants of the CTE. In their last year, they came on board as employees in the summer prior to their last year. They worked full time in the apprenticeship they continued their education in the fall and the spring, but also continued to work part time. And then when they graduated, they continued on with their apprenticeship. So that's one example in the accounting world. Another example, which we've been doing this for many, many years as unregistered is in IT and software engineering. You know, today's talent that you can find at the high school level that understands programming, either a computer programmer or an app application developer. We have created youth apprenticeships in that space, whereas the CTEs are providing individuals and even outside of the CTEs are providing individuals with the necessary education to be able to effectively perform at a entry level software or junior programming level. Many times we call those software technicians and we've created apprenticeship programs that when the individual leaves um, or is in high school, they begin to participate, then they graduate, they continue in that software technician program. Once they successfully graduate that software technician program, they can even remain as a software technician or they can move on and continue to a software engineering level, which would require in this particular employer's case, uh, additional education at the college level as well. So they sponsor these individuals through tuition reimbursement through both associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees. So those two examples. Another one is in the healthcare field. There are many LNAs and, and um, CNAs um, and even pharmacy techs, which you can actually create as long as the employer is willing to invest in that individual. And many times that investment happens the summer before they graduate. So it's they, they're doing that rising senior level. 
um, and they actually begin an apprenticeship there. The individual works for that employer. They actually feel each other out for that given occupation. And if everything works, they continue that employment through on a part time basis, right? So it's full time during the summer and then part time during the final school year. And then when they graduate, they just continue on. So healthcare is another great field for that. Advanced manufacturing. Um, Hypertherm has been doing youth apprenticeships and has been sponsoring them for now five years, where they bring on the same models they bring on. They go out to the local colleges or local high schools. They recruit high school kids and their parents to say, we want to invest in your child. They come work for us, you know, either the junior or senior. They even had some rising juniors, right? But normally it's the rising seniors. Come work with us before you graduate. You'll come, you'll learn, you'll earn. And then that following year, you'll be part-time employed and you'll continue your employment with us after that. So employers now are seeing the necessity because it's hard to buy talent on the street to go deep diving into the high schools, the CTE programs. Um, one of the things that I'm just gonna mention as a nuance and it's kind of put a pin in it is that many times the regular students who aren't CTE bound wanna participate in these apprenticeships because they see it as a great resume building opportunity before they move on to a college career. And many times the employers will convince them that you'll get your college career, we'll pay for it. And you'll do that as an employee and you'll leave college without any debt. So I'll stop there. Um, hi, this is Adele Burns. Hello, Jay. Nice to, hi there, nice to hear from you. Um, so my question was, I've actually had an interesting time defining youth apprenticeship and I've seen definitions be that youth apprenticeship is for 16 to 24 year olds. I've also heard people articulate it. Well, no, what's important that it's like youth apprenticeship starts in high school. And it's interesting for me to hear your definition, which sounded like you were saying, no, youth apprenticeship is for 16 and 17 year olds. And right. I'm just curious, like as people are thinking about putting together these programs, like obviously an apprenticeship is, it's maybe just a year, but maybe it's two years, right? And so if it starts in high school, but they're 17, but then they become 18, like, I'm wondering if you could just hone in as much as you sure. can on like the the definition of Absolutely. youth apprenticeship because otherwise it is just apprenticeship. It's, and so it's right, exactly. People are very yeah. so we're talking about, so I'll be very specific in my terms I'm gonna use. I'm talking about the US DOL registered apprenticeships. So the definition of a youth apprenticeship in the registered fashion, we're not talking grants. Right, we're just talking the definition under 29 CFR 29 and 30. The definition is an individual who is 16 or 17 because they're a youth. Once they're 18, they're an adult, right? So it's the 16s and 17 year olds. This is, we've got we to forget about grants because what you really, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the, defin, the technical definition of a youth apprenticeship is an individual who is 16 and 17 and requires a parent's signature to engage in an apprenticeship agreement with an employer, right? That is the technical definition of a youth. Now, grants will come out, right? WIOA will come out, right? With definitions of their own, right? To say, we're gonna fund youth apprenticeships from between the ages of 16 and 24, or 16 and 21, or a grant solicitation will come out. Those are the grants parameters for how they're defining the participant pool that you're allowed to utilize as part of your grant application, right? But once an individual reaches the age of 18, they are no longer a youth and they are considered an adult and therefore in a regular apprenticeship. So the simplest way, Adele, to look at it is if you are familiar with the U.S. Department of Labor's apprenticeship agreement form, it's what we call the 671, right? If you looked at that form and you, it's one page really where the, the apprentice fills it out and there's two signatures for that part A of the form. One is for the apprentice and another one is if the apprentice is 16 or 17 for the parent, right? So when you're registering an apprentice, you ask them their age. If their age is 18 or greater, they only need to sign it. If their age is 18 or less, but it has to be at least 16, 
then the apprentice and the parent signs it. That's the technical definition. Everything else, every other definition you may hear is in the context of a funding source. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. I, you know, I also think it, so thank you for that clarification. And I think you're right that um, some of the variation in definitions certainly comes from like the grant opportunities. Yes, so, exactly. For that clarity. I think I'm also thinking from the perspective of like a program development, like, do you actually stop being a youth apprentice the moment you turn 18? Right. And so like, is somebody designing a youth apprenticeship only, or should like from a program design perspective, they should be thinking like, well, we're designing a youth apprenticeship component to our apprenticeship program, because obviously we're going to have, like, we want to be starting folks into this when they're 16 17 but you know they're going to be 18 at some point in this journey and therefore like it's more about thinking about developing like a youth apprenticeship pathway into apprenticeship because the moment they turn 18 they're no longer a youth apprentice right, right. it's so, just like that's a little bit of that like program development lens that i'm trying to put on the definition okay so let's talk about that because an apprenticeship program right is defined by uh, a certain set of criteria. One of those criteria is the age of participants. Okay, so when you're designing a youth apprenticeship program with an employer, you're really designing an apprenticeship program where the employer is going to allow and permit participation in the apprenticeship of individuals who are 16 and 17 years of age. Right? So it's really important that when you define a program, you're not defining just for youth. You're defining an apprenticeship program because an apprenticeship program, again, is an employee development process where you're taking an individual from no competency and bringing them to full competency during the term of that apprenticeship. So it, you should look at it, and I would strongly suggest looking at any program, right, that you're defining your program itself as an, a, a registered apprenticeship program, regardless of who the participants will be. But, here's the but, but you want to take into consideration whether that employer is gonna be willing to allow youth to participate. And if they are, you might have to make some reconciliation between the language of your standards to permit that to happen. Like for instance, if you look at the standard template that comes out from USDOL, they're talking about you need to have a high school to program or GED, right? That's one of the basic things they always put within the criteria of an apprenticeship program for the template that's being used for the majority of folks. Majority of folks, they need to be 18 years of age. You need to have either a high school diploma or GED. Now, when you're dealing with a youth program, you want to make sure your standards have an exception put into it. And the exception is, except if the person or participant is participating, or if the individual is participating in a youth apprenticeship, this is participating in this program as a youth, and therefore the waiver of the GED or high school to program is done, is made, except that they must complete their GED or high school diploma before completing their apprenticeship. So I've put that language into many sets of standards where the employer wanted to engage the 16 and 17 year olds, but wanted to be the protected that they didn't just want to pull those individuals out and never have them complete that GED or high school uh, or high school diploma. Does that make sense? So you're, you're writing the language around the program and the set of standards for as an apprenticeship program, putting aside the participant, right? And then you're you're coming back and looking at it through the lens of, okay, if you want grant funding, employer, let's say the employer says, I don't want any grant funding, right? Well, then you wouldn't make it very limited, right? And the employer says, and I don't want, you know, and I want to have youth in it. Then you would simply put it 16, 17, right? And that's, they would actually start recruiting your participants and participate, participants would be of 16, 17 year olds. Um, but if the employer wanted to have funding associated with it, and your grant said they have to be in school youth or out of school youth, let's say I apologize, out of school youth, right? And the youth range is 16 through 24, then you have a wider net for your participant, for your recruitment. The program doesn't change. The program itself doesn't change, but your recruitment strategy does. Because the participants that are gonna be participating under that set of standards will change because the funding sources um, permitted. Great. Those. 
That's okay. That's super helpful. Thank you. I hope that helps. Okay. And someone asked me to cite the source. If you look at again, depending on where you're at, if you're in an OA state or an, uh, an SAA state, um, an OA state is an office of apprenticeship. They go by 29 CFR 29. So if you Google 29 Code of Federal Regulations or CFR 29, then you'll get to a website and it has the entire thing there. If you just search for the, I think 16, the 1 6, it will bring up the language that an apprentice uh, uh, can be no younger than 16 years of age, et cetera. And you'll find the language there. If you're in an SAA state, which is a state apprenticeship agency state where the state itself has taken on an agent role of the US Department of Labor and has created its own statutes and regulations, you need to look at those statutes and regulations of the state that govern apprenticeship to find that similar language. Okay, so we have three That's minutes good. before we're about to yeah, close. Sorry. Now, I just want to open it up for any additional questions that can sub be submitted live or via chat before we close our discussion today. And as you're monitoring that, Cassandra, you can cut me off, but I just want to talk about these extra factors. Like, what are some of the extra factors to consider? It's really about the employer, right? So on an individualized basis, you don't want to create a youth apprenticeship program for all employers, right? That's going to mat that that's going to meet all employers' needs. It'll be very, very difficult. But once you have a given employer who wants to invest in a youth, that's when you take into consideration these extra factors like school schedules. And is the employer willing to have that individual remain on their payroll, maybe not being paid because at times, you know, they're uh, an hourly employee, but remain as an employee. So the individual can go from a part time to a full time back to a part time to a full time status within the apprenticeship itself. So there needs to be flexibility in there. And also many times the employer needs to, when they're looking at posting jobs for youth apprenticeships, needs to redefine their job descriptions. More importantly, the prerequisites for entry of employment. And they already have that because people use internships. An internship and a co-op, it's just an unregistered apprenticeship with some of the factors missing. And what you're trying to do by registering it is to ensure that all the factors of an apprenticeship are present um, so that it can be successfully registered in the U.S. Department of Labor. Okay, so thank you so much, Jerry, for leading this discussion. Again, Jerry Gazi with the Institute for American Apprenticeships. Um, so if you guys want to continue the conversation as well as participate in upcoming discussions, please feel free to connect with us if you've not already connected with us over in the Youth Apprenticeship Works Community of Practice. The link is in the chat um, for upcoming sessions um, and upcoming discussions as well as resources um, related to registered apprenticeship and registered youth apprenticeship. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andrea uh, for any closing thoughts or comments. Andrea? No, thank you, Cassandra. This was a great conversation. Um, and if there are any other questions that you folks have, please don't hesitate to reach out to Cassandra, myself, or Jerry, um, and we can help address those offline as well. Um, thanks very much. And I do encourage you to pop over to the Youth Apprenticeship Works Community of Practice. Thanks so much. Thank you all for your time today. Thank Cheers. you. Guys. Thank you.